But today we're just doing the guest speaker. And then next week's practice, we'll be back getting ready for tournament next month. Woo, 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 woo. So welcome everybody. Sakai, I'm gonna let you take it away. So for our icebreaker today, our question is, what fictional character, sorry, what fictional world or place would you like to visit? So it could be a real place in the world, like an island, a serious vacation, or it can just be something from like a fictional world. So like you want to visit the Hunger Games, that's an option. That's a bad example, but that's one option. All right. So I'm just going to start listing people off. And when I call on you, you can let me know what your fictional place would be. I'm going to start with Carson. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Tokyo in Japan. That'd be cool. Nice. OK. Um, Casey? Um, anywhere. Anywhere, not even like any, just need one specific place. It doesn't have to be anything fantastic. Um, I like Europe, so that's kind of cool, but literally anywhere but here. I feel it. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, let's go with Ella. Can it be a place from a fictional book? Yes. I'd go to a, play, a continent called Pariah in a book I'm reading, Wings of Fire. Nice. Okay. Um, Emily? Um, I'd go to the Kingdom of Ardalan in a book that I'm reading. Nice. What book is it? Um, Throne of Glass. Okay. I might get some book recommendations out of here. Um, Galvin? Um, Did you say Galvin? Yes. Oh, um, I just probably want to go to Europe. Okay, there's some future study abroad people. Um, or maybe just not for school, just for fun, you know. Um, Leo? Can you ask the question again, please? Yeah, so if you can go any place, real or fictional, where would you want to go? Um, I guess Dubai. Dubai. Or Japan. Nice. We got two Japan people, something in common. Um, Madison? All right, we'll come back to Madison. Um, Mary, too? Hogwarts, that's a good one. I would also want to go to Hogwarts too. <laughs> I think that would be really, especially like Christmas at Hogwarts. I feel like that would be a really great experience. Um, let's see, Natalie. I would either go to Italy or Greece. Nice. Um, uh, Nick. No, Nick. All right, um, we'll come back. So let's go to Orit. We have a new student too. So, all right, where'd you like to go? I Me, mean, I want to go to Bora Bora or Greece. Oh, we got two Greece. Look at that. People in common, see? Um, <laughs> let's go with Ruby. Um, I would either go to Hogwarts or Spain. Nice. Okay, uh, let's go with Sophie. Um, I go to Spain. A lot of Spain. Okay. Um, let's go with Yara. So this is in the chat. It says I never read or watched Harry Potter before. Okay, so I'll read it. <laughs> so it says, I never watched the Harry Potter before, but I think it would probably be fun going to the Hogwarts School or Witchcraft in Wizardry. I think that's what it's called. Yes, totally. And then they, um, Yara also said Emerald City. 
which would also be pretty cool. So both of those are really nice. Thank you for that. Um, let's go to Sabrina. Um, I want to go to Korea. Nice. Okay. Um, let's go with Zachary. Zachary put in the chat and they said Tokyo. See, another Tokyo or another Japan. Like I said, you guys can make friends with people who are near here. <laughs> you guys all have the same possible destination. Um, let's go with Zamio. Did you say Zamil? Yes, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, the fictional place I will go to, you know, the second movie of Cloudy Chance and Meatballs? I will go to that island because I love food. That's a good one. <laughs> you get free food and a vacation. Look at that, two for one. Also, giant food. So, if he doesn't want that one, <laughs> let's go with Zia. Yeah, let's go to Singapore. Nice. Okay. And I think we have Virginia. All right, we'll just end it there. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me, Mike? So we're going to go ahead and get started. If everybody's done with the icebreaker, thank you guys for participating with Sakai. We have a guest speaker on the chat today. Her name is Miss Eileen McAndrew. She's going to introduce herself to you guys, but a little bit about her in the bio, in her bio, um, if you guys do not, did not get to read through it. Um, Eileen McAndrew is an assistant district attorney for Alameda County and is the current head of juvenile division of the Alameda County's district attorney's office. She has worked as a prosecutor for Alameda County for the last 35 years in many capacities, including as head of the stalking unit, head of elder abuse unit, and head of Pleasanton and Hayward branch offices. She is passionate about serving the community and serving victims of crime. She is a graduate, graduate, I'm sorry, I'm a graduate too. She is a graduate of University of California, Hastings College of the Law and Loyola Marymount University. We are super excited to have her join us today. So a couple of you guys had some pre-made questions. If you guys have more questions, I'm gonna ask that you guys drop them in the chat so we can read them. But I'm gonna go ahead and share these questions on the uh, screen so we all can see what was already made. Again, if you got some more that you would like to ask Miss Eileen while she is on the call with us, let us know um, in the chat, like I said, but I'm going to now give the screen to Miss Eileen. On my screen over here too. So thank you so much for having me here today. So the I'm gonna go through the pre-made questions, but not necessarily in the order that they're presented, if that's all right. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine. All right. So I'm gonna start with what is it like to be a lawyer? And there are lots of different kinds of lawyer. I am a criminal prosecutor. So I specialize in criminal law. Um, and so my day is very different from somebody who does corporate law or business law. There's lots of different fields of law and they, they're all different depending on what, they're, what they do. Um, but to be a lawyer, you have to do a lot of reading. You have to do a lot of critical analysis. Um, you have to understand how facts fit into certain laws and, and you have to analyze all of those things. So to be a lawyer, you have to be a critical thinker and you have to analyze things and sort things out. Um, do I feel and empathize with the cases I try? So as a criminal prosecutor, I deal with a lot of people who have been victimized by crime, sometimes really serious violent crimes like murder and rape and kidnapping and robberies. And it, when terrible things have happened to people and you're asking them about it, it's, it's hard on everybody. So you know, somebody who has suffered trauma because they've been a victim of crime, then I have to ask them to tell me about their trauma, this terrible thing, sometimes the worst thing that ever happened to them so that they can tell a, a judge or a jury about it. And so 
I, I do feel a lot of empathy for the people that come in and who have been victimized by crime. It's a really hard thing. I also know that a lot of times the people who commit the crimes, we have to put things in context and they have also suffered a lot of trauma. One of the things about juvenile law in particular is that we are trauma informed and we look at the whole youth and, and we try to figure out what's gonna be the most appropriate way to help that young person deal with any trauma they may have experienced so that they are rehabilitated and they don't continue to commit crimes. Let's see, I only do juvenile law right now, but I have, not, I have done lots of different um, criminal law through my career. In fact, most of my career I have spent on the adult side. Um, I have done, when I was a very young lawyer, I came to juvenile and handled some juvenile cases. And then in the middle of my career, I came to juvenile again. And now later in my career, I'm running our juvenile branch. So now I only do juvenile law, but I've done a lot of other things uh, before that. There are many, many challenging cases um, that we deal with. Like I said, we, we're dealing many times with people who have suffered great trauma as victims of crime. And so those to me are very, very challenging cases. And sometimes we know somebody has been seriously injured because of a violent crime and we can't prove it. And so if we can't prove a case, then nobody gets, there's no, uh, for many people, there's no closure if they don't, if we can't capture the person and successfully prosecute them. Um, if I damage property, do I help you? Well, not really. Um, if you damage property, then I'm not gonna be the person who helps you. You'll have your own lawyer to help you. I'm gonna be the person who wants to say, you need to take responsibility for the damage that you caused and you need to make this right. You need to make amends. So I would be the person on probably on the other side saying, don't damage property. And when you do, you have to pay for it and those kinds of things. Um, a typical workday for me is I come, I'm still coming to the office. We are considered essential workers. So I come to the office every day. I spend a lot of my day reviewing police reports uh, to determine whether we have sufficient evidence to charge a case. And if we do have sufficient evidence to charge a case, whether we should send it to diversion or whether we need to, to actually prosecute the case. So explain I, to them what diversion is. Sorry to interrupt you. Great. No. So, so if somebody commits a crime, there are lots of different paths that case can go. So one path is that we throw the book at them and we want to prosecute them to the full extent of the law. And for some cases that may be appropriate. For some other cases, we look at the case and the, the person involved and say, you know what? We've never seen this person before. This is a kind of case that we think we can successfully send out of the system, not prosecute, and, and hopefully we'll never see this person again. Maybe refer this person to counseling um, and, or handle it informally through another means and we don't actually charge the case. So that's, that's what I mean by diversion. Uh, on, in our juvenile court in Alameda County, one of the ways we divert cases is through a community-based organization called Community Works. And they do restorative justice, which is where a person who has committed a harm will sometimes meet with the person that they've harmed. They learn about the harm that they've caused and they try to make amends for the harm that they've caused. And so for people, for, for some people, that's a really appropriate way to divert the case out of the, the court system. Um, let's see. And I'm going to kind of skip to the bottom one. What advice would I give to somebody who wants to be a lawyer? Uh, first of all, there are a lot of lawyers, but as my dad used to tell me when I was, when I was thinking about being a lawyer, there are never enough good ones. So if you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a good one. And to be a good lawyer, first of all, you have to read, read, read. You have to be a good reader. You have to be interested in what you read and be able to digest it. You have to be able to analyze, analyze facts and, have, and be a good critical thinker. Just because somebody says something's true 
doesn't mean it is. You have to do your own research to figure out what actually happened. And my path was I went to college and then I went to law school. I had many friends who went to college and then took a break and did something else and then decided they wanted to be lawyers and they're excellent lawyers too. There's no really no one path for to be a lawyer, but but I went to college and then I went to law school and here I am 35 years later. And I know that's really a long time. <laughs> so that's that's kind of my gist. Are there some questions that I can? I was gonna say a question I heard while listening to you is like, it, what is something you would say about how expensive college is or even taking on oh. such a career as being a lawyer? What are some real um, things that students and young people should look out for or scholarships or you know anything you wish that man i wish somebody would have said that to me you know that you could give right. back yeah so education has become very very expensive and especially the um the trade school not not trade schools but the professional schools like medical school and and law school and those kinds of things are horrendously expensive even the state schools so I was really lucky. I went to the University of California, Hastings, Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. So that's a state school. That made it much more affordable than a lot of the private law schools. But even now, the state schools are not as well supported as they were when I was in school. And so it costs just a lot more money, a lot more student loans. So that I, I don't know how to finance an education. You know, I'm, I'm trying to help out my own kids with their educations, but not everybody can do that. You know, one path, and I've, I've had several friends who took this path, is if you're really serious and want to work really hard, you can start at a junior college, which is much more affordable, do all of your general education courses at a, a community college, and then transfer to a four-year college. You know, you could transfer to Cal if you're doing well at a community college. And then you can graduate from Cal, but you've only paid for a couple of years. You're on Cal. mute. Oh, I don't know why. Shows that I'm on. No? Uh, no, you're not. We can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm not on mute. All right. Yes. All right. We, we so, got a couple of questions. Um, we got a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, so we have... One student is asking, what is a common misconception about your job? A common misconception about my job is that I just wanna send people to prison for as long as possible. That is not what I do every day. So there are some cases where that might be the appropriate thing to do, but mostly we're looking at what is fair and equitable. And we wanna see, especially on the juvenile side, we don't want to see people come back. We want to make sure that they're getting the services they need so that they don't end up coming back. And then another question we have is, how many years is a life sentence for a juvenile? That's a really good question. So, and, and there's layers to that. The law in California has changed a lot in the last few years. So first of all, um, if you, are committed to life in prison. If you are a youthful offender, you are looked at sooner than an older person who commits a crime. So life may not mean life. Uh, most cases that happen that juveniles do, they all, they all have to start in the juvenile court and a judge has to decide whether if a 16 year old or older has committed like the most serious crimes like murder, whether that person should be handled in juvenile court or adult court. If they are handled in juvenile court, they can be held until they're 25 years old. That's the maximum sentence for juvenile, a juvenile case. But if they go to adult court on a murder, they could held, be held in, for life until parole lets them out. And that's a okay. big difference. It is a big difference. That's yeah. A major difference. Difference. Right. Good questions, you guys. Yeah. The other question is, when dealing with individuals with trauma, how do you do your job compassionately while not taking on the emotional baggage? That's a tough one, right? That is a really good question. And, you know, everybody 
who deals with people who, you know, I, I feel like there's ambient trauma. There's trauma around me. I'm not, I'm not in an emergency room, like, you know, an emergency room doctor or something where there's trauma all the time, but I have people telling me about their trauma all the time. And so sometimes I have to say, you know what, I can't hear anymore today and I need to go for a hike in the hills. Or, you know, I used to run until my knees got sore. So I've, I've always had to have some kind of a physical outlet to make sure that I don't take it in too much because it, you know, hearing about other people's trauma is, it just is a burden and it's really hard. And I'm always trying to find that balance. You know, a lot of lawyers and, and other people who deal with people who are dealing with trauma all the time, you know, they drink too much, they do drugs. I, I don't want to do that. So I have to, I do physical work, physical exercise, and I get into the, the nature. That helps a lot. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but my internet isn't working and I can't hear anything. So I'm trying to switch us around. Um, right now, Sakai is the host, but I can't hear anything if you guys are talking. Okay, so, so I just- Sakai I just, or Brooke, can you guys read the questions in the chat so you guys can continue the conversation? while I figure out what's going on with my internet. Yeah, totally. Um, so let's see. We just talked about, okay. So we have a question that says, what is the hardest case that you have worked on? If you can remember, um, what would you do if your superior asked you to file a case but you did not believe beyond a reasonable doubt the crime was committed by the defendant? Um, so yeah, that was the last one. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the second question first. If somebody says I should file a case that I don't think I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. I've actually had that happen in my career and my ethical obligation is to not file a case unless I can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So I did not file the case. Um, and luckily I work in an office where my judgment is respected um, and we can go from there. One of the most, one of the cases that has really stuck with me for decades was a murder case. It was a domestic violence murder case where a man murdered his girlfriend in front of their very small daughter, their three-year-old daughter. And, I, and he was on, he was on drugs and he turned on the oven and took off, took the oven racks out and put the child in the oven, but then changed his mind, but only after some beads from her hair melted in the oven and she had some burns on her by the time the police got there. So, I mean, this, this child watched her mother get murdered and then was put in an oven by the drug addicted dad. And that one just, that one is one that just really sticks with me. And, I always wondered whatever happened to that little girl who suffered so much trauma at such an early age. Okay, should I look in the chat? Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, I know these aren't easy <laughs> questions, but <laughs> we appreciate you still um, answering them. Um, I had um, a question in private message that said, how do you feel when you lose a case or if you lose a case? I'm disappointed when I lose a case because I believe in it. If I, if I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't be bringing it. So, you know, but reasonable minds differ. Sometimes, you know, I have a, a person and I listen to them and everything they say makes sense. And a judge listens to the same person reciting the same facts and say, nope, not buying it. Um, so it is, it can be very disappointing or 12 jurors can't agree on it. Sometimes, you know, 10 say, yeah, that totally happened. And two say, yeah, no, or we're not, we're just not convinced. So, so it's very disappointing when you put your heart and soul into something, you know, you, you do all this work and you say, here it is, here it is, here it is. And then somebody says, yeah, no, <laughs> it's a, it's a disappointment. Let's see. So there's a question. If you know, when the person you're defending is guilty, how do you deal with it? So I don't deal with people who uh, have been accused of a crime. I'm on the side that accuses them of a crime. So if somebody is charged with a crime, I'm on that side and their lawyer will represent them. And 
I have a lot of friends who are criminal defense attorneys who I greatly respect and admire. And I, I know that they, they have told me the way, the reason that they represent people, even if they know that they're guilty, is they need, they need to at least show that there's something in mitigation, that, that it's not everything that the DA says. You know, yeah, maybe my client did you know, do a robbery, but he didn't do all the other things that, that he's accused of. And they can point those things out. Also, the criminal defense attorneys let us know about what, you know, the context. If somebody committed a robbery because they were starving, if they committed a robbery because they were, they needed, they were upset about something and they, they wanted, you know, hurt people, hurt people, and they want to put um, their client in context, that's very, very helpful. But I myself, I don't, I don't deal with people, I don't represent people who have been charged with a crime. Have I ever gone against a friend? Um, I actually have many friends who are criminal defense attorneys um, and we try to keep it very professional, you know? Um, they wouldn't be my friend if we were, if we got personal and were name calling that's not the kind of person I would want as a friend. So it, these are facts and we might disagree on some things, but we can be professional about it. So, you know, it's hard. And sometimes, you know, neither one of us wants to talk to the other for a day or two, but then we get over it because ultimately it's a friendship. Um, I have two questions, if you can. Okay, me. yes. Um, so if, if I were to ask, um, I, I'm not sure since you're, there's different topics about uh, different lawyers and all that. But if you were to request a, if you, if I were to ask you what lawyer school, what lawyer college, um, would be the best? Which one would be the best right now? Ooh, I don't really have an answer for that. I'm a little out of touch with what are the best schools. Um, I know that state schools are more affordable than private schools. But, you know, if you got a great deal at a private school, if you got scholarship money, that might be better. Um, it's, it's pretty competitive to get into. And sometimes people don't have a lot of choices about where they go because they got into, you know, one school. And that's the school they're going to go to. So, you know, I, there's, there's always information available online on how schools are ranked, if that's important. I mean, the bottom line is, like I started out with, if you're a good lawyer, it doesn't really matter it doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter where you went to school. If you're gonna be hired by a big New York, New York law firm and they only hire people from Ivy League schools, then it matters. But you know, for what I do, it's, it, I just have to be competent, you know, and I have to exercise judgment and discretion and, and work hard. So the, the school that I went to is not, not the beginning and end of my career. Does that answer okay. your question? Yeah. And uh, my second question was, um, what's it called? When, if when you apply or want to, or when you're in college, what would be the best thing that would help you get, like your law, like a lawyer job? Like, what can help you get like a a better percentage of you getting a yes in like the lawyer industry? So I'm, I'm a big believer in having um, lots of interests and doing a lot of different kinds of outreach. And I think if you do that, you're a much more rounded human being and you're much more desirable for any kind of job. You know, like I said, if you're, if you're trying to get a job with a fancy New York firm and they only hire people that are, that are certain thing, then you do that. But, but otherwise, you know, if you are interested, find the things that you love. You know, if you're passionate about music or theater or, I mean, none of that's happening right now, but if you're passionate about those things and you love them, then, then get involved with that. And you never know, you might end up working for an entertainment law firm because you are passionate about the arts or something like that. But yet, you know, especially when you're younger and you, you can branch out, try lots of different things and see what is what will just start spark that passion for you we have a couple questions in the chat 
Have you ever gone again against a friend and how did you feel? I think you answered that. And then you have, have you faced any sexism in your career? If so, how did you handle it? So you can tell I'm old because I've got gray hair. So I've been around for a long time. <laughs> and so when I was a young lawyer, which was a long time ago, um, there were, it was a very male dominated profession and the judges were all old men and I was surrounded by a lot of old men. I was lucky that in our office, there were some really fantastic women. Um, and I was not the first one. There were, there were some people who had already come in and kind of set the tone. But early in my career, you know, men acted like it was a big frat party. You know, the office felt like, you know, the, 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 the men in back in the day, and this was a long time ago, you know, they treated the office like it was a big frat party. And there was not a lot of respect for women and we had to kind of earn our respect. So for example, a really, really long time ago, this does not reflect the office where I work now, but a really long time ago, there was a, a co-ed bathroom and some of the older men had posted pictures of scantily clad women in the co-ed bathroom. You know, that's just stupid, but you know, we just, we just took the pictures down. That was a stupid thing for them to do. So we took them down. They just disappeared one night. Um, you know, people have said inappropriate things and sometimes they're so stupid, you laugh at them. And sometimes you say, are you out of your mind? You have to call them on it. Um, things, have, things have changed over time. You know, the, the legal profession has changed. There are a lot more women. There are women judges, they're women, I'm a supervisor, you know, they're women supervisors. And so everything about it has changed, but especially early in my career there, the sexism was pretty rampant. Mm, thank you for sharing that experience. Another question we have is what are some, what are some preventative measures that you think should be adopted to lower the amount of justice involved youth? Ooh, I like that question a lot. I really like that question. And to me, that's the magic unicorn that we're all looking for. Um, I would love to see fewer justice involved youth. There are well, a lot of times the youth that we end up seeing uh, have suffered trauma and things, the systems haven't really worked for them. So maybe the system in their neighborhood doesn't work very well. Maybe their family system isn't working very well. The school system hasn't worked very well for them. We see a lot of kids um, who, who really need to have their educational needs addressed much more aggressively than the school districts may have addressed them before. We have a lot of kids who have learning differences and schools, you know, they, they think one size fits all and it really doesn't. And so, you know, if I had, you know, the gajillion dollars what could I do? You know, I might want to build a community school where all the services are provided from birth um, for the parents, for the neighborhood, and for the youth so that there are no gaps. And then we, we hopefully wouldn't see the justice, the, the kids that we see right now. But usually the systems aren't working for the kids that we see. Another question we had, what is the most surprising case you have ever worked? Hmm, the most surprising. I don't know. I, I can think of the most disturbing, but the most surprising. <laughs> well, you know, I did have a stalking case many, many years ago where it turns out the woman who claimed to be a victim was kind of crazy and she made the whole thing up. Um, and luckily, you know, I, I found out very early on and we were able to, the lawyer who represented the person that she accused came, gave me some information early on and convinced me not only that I couldn't prove the case, but that the guy was actually innocent. And that surprised me. I mean, there are a lot of cases that I can't prove, but I don't have a lot of, case, a lot of cases where, where I start out believing that somebody's committed a crime and then it's like, oh, they're actually innocent. But on that case I did, and I told the lawyer I would sign a declaration that your client is factually innocent so he can get that police report taken off his record. And we did. So that was a little bit of a surprise. 
That's pretty interesting. Were you happy? How were you able to catch? I get yeah. How are you able to catch it? I guess or you didn't know that. Okay, so I, I have a question. If okay. when you're in those kind of situations, if you have a feeling like this person really did this, are you? I guess can you fight harder or that or like? I guess how do you prove? How do you handle that? Do you have any personal feelings or you're just there of like I'm presented the evidence and I'm just here to represent the state kind of thing? I'm more of the later. So I get a police report and my job is to be uh, cold and objective about it. Can I prove this case? I have, I get a lot of police reports like, oh, I know this kid did this and I can't prove it. You know, and, and the police like, oh, come on. It's like, no, you know, I'm not going to charge it. You know, I can't prove this. You know, sometimes the detectives who I've worked with many times, you know, I'll talk it's like, I've read this police report. Is there something I'm missing? Because there's, there's nothing I can charge here. And it's like, no, you know, we were hoping it was going to get better. It didn't. It's like, okay, then just, just checking. I didn't want to make sure I didn't miss anything on that. So, you know, it's, it can be really upsetting. Like if somebody reports that they've been a victim of a sexual assault, and then the facts, as I read them, I can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was actually a sexual assault because there's a good defense. You know, that's very disappointing for the person who feels victimized. Mm. What would you say has been the impact of the 1994 crime bill on juvenile justice today? Okay, I don't, I don't remember the 1994 crime bill. Which one? What I think that was... I think that was Clinton incarcerated, the one he rallied about uh, war on drugs, I want to say. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm not prepared. I, I would have to research what exactly that bill was. I don't, I don't remember. And the impact. Understand. Yeah. Okay. How, do you, how did you feel in your first case? Oh, very nervous. I, had, I didn't even know where I was supposed to sit in the courtroom until somebody told me where I was supposed to be. <laughs> Like you guys, she too got lost in rounds. See, y'all not alone. It doesn't stop. Like, That's right. Like, like, you know, it gets it gets better over time. But the first time, it's like, ah, what am I doing? Do you does psychology play a role in court? I would say yes. And if we don't think that mental health, there's psychology, and then there's you know the whole mental health. We have a lot of. Uh, victims of crime who have mental health issues and need psychological assistance. We have a lot of perpetrators of crime who have needs for mental health services. So yes, I would say all the time. And, you know, we're always, if we're picking a jury to try and be the, the fair and impartial fact finders, you know, we're trying to, to try to can't read minds, but it's like, we're trying to figure out if this person is going to be fair and objective under these facts. So there's some psychology there and of course I'm not a trained psychologist so it's it's best guess and and what we think we know um I was the one that asked that question but uh -huh. is it like therapists um that help the person go through like help them get over their trauma yes and that is an excellent question so for example if we have a victim of crime in the Alameda County DA's office, we have a whole victim witness program. And we have advocates who work with victims of crime to help get them connected to therapists, to help them deal with their trauma. And there's a state funded victims of crime um, pool of money. And some of their therapy costs can be reimbursed by the state because they were victims of crime. And then on the other side for especially on the juvenile side for perpetrators of crime. If they're at juvenile hall, there's a whole guidance clinic uh, here, behavioral health specialists who can help connect our young people with um, services in the community for counseling or other behavioral health services. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So another question we have is, what do you do after a stressful case? I go for a hike in the woods, in the hills. That's, that, that's my, that's my go-to. I take my dog out and we go in the hills. How do you filter out police bias? How do I filter out police? Okay. I'm not, I don't know exactly what that means. So I, my job is to look at a case separate and apart from what the police say. Um, so I, I read a police report, but that's not the, that's not the end of the inquiry. 
sometimes I can tell, I think I know what happened based on a police report. Sometimes I need more information. Um, you know, one of the things I know you guys are discussing is body-worn cameras. I love body-worn cameras. I love to see what's on body-worn cameras. If I have a bad feeling about a case, like, hmm, I don't know about this, I can get more information from viewing the body-worn camera. I get information about the people around the police officer. I get a, a perspective of, of the police officer, how he or she was behaving, what the tone was. You get a lot of information from that body-worn camera. So in, there are some cases, you know, so, so let's see, where would be, like if, uh, if the police have arrested somebody for resisting arrest, um, there's a whole range of resisting arrest kinds of cases. There's the, the there's SAS talk, which could, some officers think is resisting arrest. And then there's, you know, the full on um, physical violence and that, and if there's a body worn camera, I wanna see all of that. I wanna see what's going on and, and whether, you know, whether it's, it's appropriate ever to, to charge that case. And was, was there, who was behaving badly? And was there a way to deescalate? And, and does that make a difference in my charging decision? Does that answer that question? I, I'm not yes. totally sure. Okay. You're fine. What's okay. the, there's another one. What's an, they're giving you questions now. Okay. What's an example of a case where you are very sure who did the crime, but you can't prove it? Oh, I get those a lot. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I do, <laughs> I do. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of street robberies, um, we might have uh, perpetrators who are wearing very generic clothing. They might get caught a short distance away. The victims can't identify them because it was dark. Um, there, there's other things that, that the police know. There's enough to arrest but there's no way I can charge that case. Nobody can identify these people as people who did it. But there are some of these perpetrators, you know, that the fact that they're running to, with their regular group that they rob people with, and they're here together again, you know, those kinds of things like, oh, they probably did this one. I just can't prove it. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then you have another one. Uh, is there a lawyer who inspires you? If so, who is it? Hmm. I think there were probably several lawyers who inspired me and some of them were fictional, like TV lawyers and lawyers from books. And so, you, you know, I'm old. So I grew up when I remember as a small child watching lots of bad things happening on TV, a lot like this year. I was eight years old when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, when there were riots at the Democratic National Committee. And I remember that because there was so much angst in the world. And it's like, I shouldn't have been watching the TV news. It was too disturbing. Vietnam War was going on. There was all this stuff going on. As a young teenager, the Watergate scandal with President Nixon was going on. And, you know, I like to read a lot of books and I would see these shows on TV with lawyers. And I like to argue a lot. So my family said, you know what? You should be a lawyer because you like to argue. <laughs> So it was kind of a combination of all those things that made it seem like a good idea to be a lawyer. And then of course, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg being on the Supreme Court, but I was an adult by that time. So, so they weren't the ones that got me there, but they definitely were inspiring. And then when I first joined Alameda County DA's office, uh, Carol Corgan, who's now a justice on the California Supreme Court, was in our office, and she was in charge of recruiting. And she was so amazing, and I, I, she definitely inspired me. Another question you have, I'm gonna combine these: are how old were you when you when you made your first case, and when did you win your first case? I was 26 for both. So. <laughs> That sounds like a cool way to enter 26. I give you that. That's a good, that's a bomb way to enter 26. Um, what do you do if you think a judge is not acting impartial? Oh, that is a good question too. So there are, there is a procedure if a judge is not acting uh, impartially 
that you can challenge a judge and say, I don't want you on this case because you're not being impartial. We don't do that very often because for the most part, the judges do try to be impartial. You know, we may disagree. They do try to be impartial. But if, um, if we have, you know, we're evidence-based. If we are keeping track of stuff that's happening and we see a pattern where things are, thing, bad things keep happening to one side, particularly our side, then we might talk to um, our boss about whether we should be challenging a judge. But there is a, there is a remedy, there's a procedure to do that. What major did you study in college and do you have any suggestions on majors people should go into if they have an interest in law? So first I have no suggestion about majors except do what you love because then it's easy. I was a political science major and I don't love political science so that was a mistake. But I also had a minor in history and English which I did love. And so if I had figured that out earlier, I would have changed my, changed my uh, major and I would probably would have been a history major instead because <laughs> I, I like that a lot more. Have you ever procrastinated while working on a hard case? If so, how do you deal with procrastination? I guess that's a trait. Yes. Yeah, so how do you, you're dealing with people's lives. You don't want to wake up the day of and be like, oh, right, like. right. right. <laughs> so you know, luck favors the prepared, right? So if you are prepared, if you are prepared and you don't procrastinate, you will have better luck. And of course, I've had to learn that lesson the hard way. And in raising my kids, I've had to teach that lesson over and over again, you know, because uh, procrastination is just anxiety. If you can say, you know, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it because you're afraid of not being successful or you're afraid you're not going to do right then you're just gonna create this bigger problem because then it's gonna be late and you're gonna to have to rush. So, so I, I hope I learned early enough that I cannot procrastinate. I just have to dig in. You're, what motivated you to get into law and why did you pick that as the ultimate career for you? Sort of that whole thing about growing up, how I grew up and because I like to argue, my family suggested I should be a lawyer. Like the TV shows, do the lie detector evidence get into court? No, <laughs> no, 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 not in California. So in California. can you explain to us too the difference of being in California compared to the national government of some of those differences? Yeah, so, you know, California has its own rules and lie detectors have not, I mean, it can be a tool, but it's not gonna be evidence in a court. Um, you can't hypnotize somebody and bring them into court either. You know, there's stuff that, is just not allowable in a courtroom because it's not really tried and true. It's so, so yeah, we don't do, we don't do lie detectors tests, lie detector tests. Another question we have is, have you ever met important people who's driven your passion to become a lawyer? Has, has anybody driven your passion, I guess, or any important people that drove your passion? I think you answered that. Have you ever had a judge who was on the criminal side I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever had a, a criminal judge like the TV shows a corrupt judge? I think. That's oh, what no, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I think that's what I, the kids are asking. You. I sure hope not. You know, there there was a time many, many years ago where a, a judge in Oakland committed a misdemeanor and his case got transferred to a court where I was working. So he had his lawyer enter his plea over there and then he he had already resigned from the bench. If you're a judge, you have to resign if you get a misdemeanor? No, nah, I think he was just done. I think oh, okay. I'm like, oh, wow. Well, so they're yeah. like, no. So if you're a lawyer and you get in trouble, what happens to you? It depends. So I am an at will employee. That means I could, after 35 years, get fired for no reason because the district attorney is a political position. So, um, if there's if there were a rule that if I you know got arrested for a DUI that I lose my job then that would happen. Um, so it depends on who the district attorney is and what the rules are and and what what is tolerable. So I served on the Oakland Police Commission before Measure LL passed. Mm -hmm. One thing um, with body cams, I think about when you mentioned body cameras is the perspective, I guess, is limited to me as a commissioner because we're only getting the officer's vantage point of like it. 
Um, do you have any feedback about body cams of like, can we improve this technology or is it something else that needs to be done to really rectify the relationship between the community and police? Oh, it's, it's a bigger issue than that. Right. The, the body camera, you're right. It is a limited perspective. Um, you know, an officer can be looking this way with his head turned and his camera looks this way. Right. <laughs> right. right. So you don't know what he sees. You right. see what's in front of him, but you don't know what he sees. And there are some, there are some body worn cameras that are on glasses. So it follows the head. Um, and, but those get broken more easily because they're smaller and lighter and they get knocked off people's faces. Even the body worn cameras that are worn on the chest, they get knocked off a lot. I mean, it's, it's an imperfect technology, but I think it helps a lot because what you may not capture on the video, you can often capture on the audio. You can still hear what's happening. You can still hear the voices. And, you know, if there's, if he's looking over there and there's noise and then he turns his body and runs that way, now you know why he's responding to that. He or she is doing that. Um, it, that they're imperfect for a lot of reasons. Uh, they don't come on automatically. Um, so there's human error involved, you know, they, they, they have to touch their chest or they have to activate the thing. If they didn't activate it, they thought they did, they hit their chest, they were running and they didn't turn it on, then you miss that piece. Um, or there's, you know, we had this recently, there's riots going on and, you know, you can, just can't do enough. Plus the battery life for the cameras is limited. So if you're running your camera the whole time you're out, the battery dies after like four hours. You know, it lasts for a shift if you turn it on and off. But if you have it running continuously, it's a it will run out of steam pretty quickly. So, so there's still a lot of limitations with body worn cameras. That sounds like putting a lot of tech in on an already stressed situation too. Yeah. And I tell your officers, um, you know, they can, it just sounds like like you said, there's bigger issues, and that just sounds like it band aided it, it to yes another perspective. But there's other now more. Yes compile yeah. issues with that right that doesn't solve the problem but it's i think it's a you know i really like that agencies have body worn cameras i think everybody behaves better when they know they're on camera are you I allowed think. to say something if you see an officer behaving badly on a body camera is it your job to say i have an issue with this or i have done that oh you know, okay. if i have an issue yeah yeah we, so. Yes, we don't know that. That's why we're like, if you see something, do you, is it your job to be like, wait a minute, or because of your job, you're just like, I'm not, that's not what I'm here for, you know? You know, if they drop the F-bomb, I don't care, you know? And if, I don't know if that's their policy that they're not allowed to drop the F-bomb. If I see something that is pro very problematic, then I will say something. Thank you for that. Yeah. We have another question. This is random, but what happens if someone raises their left hand Instead of the right, I think they're talking about swearing on the Bible on the stand. <laughs> I don't think, I think they'll probably be corrected. Like, oh, the other hand, please. I don't, but it will not invalidate the oath. About, the oath. <laughs> That's not a way to get out of that. You're going no. to jail. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen a police acting unreasonable? She just answered that unreasonably through a body cam. You say yes. Um. Is there anything that you feel like young people should know about the juvenile justice before they're entangled in the juvenile justice? You know, a lot of these young people have friends and things like that who who might be, you know, entangled or on the on the edge. So is there any advice you can give to young people, you know, as they walk away from this conversation with you, things that they should think twice about or are expected to be thinking about? you know, cause they're held to that standard. We went over it last week. You guys do not want to meet Miss McAndrew, but if you do, you can meet her as early as 14 years old. You can be in, in front of 12. her. 12. I lied, 12. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we try not to have 12 year olds here, you know, but yeah, 12. You so could... think about that. That's California and we're supposed to be a pretty cool state. Imagine Texas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we, we don't really, you know, 12 year olds are pretty young it would have to be something really egregious for us to see a 12 year old. And again, you know, we recognize that a lot of these young people in context, you know, they have suffered a lot of trauma and they may need access to certain services. 
So if somebody needing services comes into the system, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You don't really, you really don't want to see me and you don't want me to know your name. You really don't. I mean, in this context here is great, but um, so it's, it's really about making good choices. And some of the things that we see that are really deeply disturbing are, you know, the gun violence. We're seeing way, way, way too many guns. Guns are not toys. And we're seeing, you know, we had a month ago, three justice involved youth were murdered. And that was just heartbreaking. You know, these are the people that we want to be rehabilitated. It's a very bad outcome to have a 16 year old in a body bag. Even if they made, made mistakes before and committed a crime, nobody wants to see that kid in a body bag. We want him or her to be successful. We want them to be rehabilitated and back in school and doing all the right things. So that's just a heartbreak. Um, so the big thing is to make good choices. Your peers matter who you choose as your friends matters. If you're hanging out with people who you knew, know are doing scary, risky things, those aren't the people you wanna hang with. Those are the people that are gonna hurt you and get you in trouble. You know, a long time ago, we had a case where a kid had a gun at a school. And when the police arrived, he put the gun in the backpack of the girl next to him. And like she, and then, of course, the gun gets caught in her backpack. They both end up getting arrested and taken down to the local uh, sheriff's department. You know, and and luckily, she didn't encourage him. She had she basically said, why'd you do that to me? But there are people who say, yeah, you can put your loaded gun in my backpack and they're going to go down for the loaded gun. So it just, you know, the loaded gun thing is one of the things that really, really gets me right now. We're seeing a real uptick in gun violence, particularly in Oakland. It is heartbreaking. There's a lot of young people running around with, with guns. So please stay away from guns. Thank you for sharing that. All right, can I ask a question? Yes. All right, um, so in school, um, I think on Monday we were told, yesterday, we were, no. Yeah, Monday, we were told that um, you could go to jail for receiving, like, this was mainly for high schoolers, not more for middle schools, but um, but we were told that if you receive a photo of someone naked, like, you could actually go to um, prison for that. And so I wanted to learn more about that because, like, it happens, and it's like, um, what do you do with it? And I, and and I haven't had an experience like that, but I just wanted to know, like, what to do just, so, you know, because you could, because I was so that you could go to jail, even though you didn't ask for it. So possession of that, possession usually of that kind of child pornography, because it's probably of a young person, probably of a young girl, that is a crime. So delete it. If you don't have it, then you, you won't be charged with possessing it. It's a bigger problem if you forward it to anybody because then you are distributing child pornography and that is a bigger problem. And you got to remember, you know, you've got somebody, that is a picture of somebody, maybe somebody you know, and they don't have control of that image. And now that image is being used to hurt, usually her, usually it's a girl who's being hurt. So somebody might have convinced a girl to, you know, take a naked booby picture you know, or, or take a different kind of picture. And then now that girl doesn't have control of that image and it's getting sent around the school. That is a problem. And it can be used for bullying. It can be used to make that girl feel less than, than human. Uh, so the best thing to do is if you know who sent that, you tell them to stop. But most importantly, you get it off your phone as soon as possible. Delete, delete, delete. You don't want it. You tell them you don't want it. And for sure, don't send it to anybody because that is an even bigger problem. Thank that you for sharing you. that with them. Nick, thank you. Great question for them. It's a great question. What, what so, so we're about to wrap up. It is now 434. We got a couple more questions um, that students have for you. What if someone is pressured into confessing something they didn't do? How do you find this out? So most of the time, the 
they don't, if somebody is saying that they did something, they are asked about details that only they would know. So it's, from my perspective, it's hard to admit to something that, it, it, we don't see a lot of people confessing to something they didn't do because they don't have enough information about it to clear it up. So good trained investigators are gonna ask questions to make sure that this person really knows what they're talking about. Cause we don't want people to admit to things they did not do. So if the person, you know, if, if they're looking for somebody who is six feet tall um, with purple hair who did this crime and somebody who's five feet tall with orange hair comes in, says, I did it. They're kind of go, really? You know, we've got video of a purple haired six foot person. So we're not going to believe you that that doesn't quite fit. But but if they match the physical description or they have a good physical description and they're saying stuff, they're going to say, well, what do you know about this? And what about it this? So that it has some veracity. There have been a couple of cases that I've seen where it looks like somebody is taking the fall for a case like, oh, yeah, that's my gun when I don't think it really is. And if I don't think it, that they're telling the truth about it, I don't charge it. You're on mute. Thank you. I'm going to get used to this new tech, e -tech world. I was saying thank you again for answering the questions of our students today. I really appreciate you joining us. If we can all give Ms. McAndrew a round of applause. I know y'all can't see, but we look like penguins because we'd be on silent. But <laughs> thank you. And you. thank you, Ms. If you all have any questions about body worn camera and what it looks like from my perspective, I'm happy to talk to you as yes, you're preparing please. your stuff. Okay. If you could give us any more feedback, and we're welcome, we would love for you to come back and join us again. If you could give us any feedback on body cameras that students can look out for. They just had their first tournament about two weeks ago, so all of them are still learning the, the uh, configurations of the good and bad of body cameras. But yes, if you can give us any feedback of things to look out for, things you've seen, most of them have probably not seen body cameras unless they're released to the public. Even uh, talking them through that process of most of them do not know that body cameras are not immediately just made available to the public because there's a shooting. Like it's all, it's, it's a whole background noise to that of like what right. gets sent out, what gets made to the public on what timeline and what, what background information is accompanied with that. Yeah. And, and there is so much body worn camera footage that of course is not related to shootings. You know, that's just that every time, you know, a traffic stop, they they turn on their body worn camera. They, uh, you know, anytime there's an interaction, they are turning on the body worn camera. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of body worn camera unrelated to shootings. And um, what I see most of the time is everybody behaves better when they know they're on camera. Everybody, the, the people on the street behave better. The police officers probably behave better. Everybody's behaving better because they're being recorded. That was something we seen on, on OPD too, that um, on both sides claims of abuse went down uh, and it left room for the ones that were valid. Of, I have a concern about OPD. We could really filter through and get through of like tone, talking to people, how they're interacting with people, things like that, as opposed to like up in the air of he said, she said, what happened with the officer? Right, no, it, it cleared up a lot of stuff. So. It, and I had talked early on when some of the police departments were just coming to the point where they were getting body worn cameras, you know, and the, the rank and file officers were kind of conflicted. Do I want this? And most of the officers thought they didn't. But until they started seeing that everybody behaved better on camera. So it's cool. Have you ever had a police officer as a defendant? Yes, I have. And um, one of my jobs has been to charge you know, to charge crimes and read police reports. So I have had to charge police officers. Of course, they get laid off or they, they get put on leave immediately. They're not allowed into the buildings once they're charged with a crime or they know that they're suspe suspected of a crime. Do they know they've been suspected of a crime? Is it like, or like- It depends. I guess you know. Yeah, so it depends. So. So several years ago, when I was working in our Hayward branch, there was a Hayward police officer that tried to extort a woman. Um, and she 
did exactly the right thing. She went to uh, the San Leandro Police Department said, I don't want to report this to Hayward because it's a Hayward police officer. And they helped her do the investigation and they put together a really solid case. He got arrested and and we charged the case and he was convicted. So mm. yeah, it all it all got doesn't done. matter. You commit a crime. That's pretty yeah. interesting to hear. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. So I can't remember the officer's name. And he, you know, he's now an ex officer and convicted felon, but you don't, you don't get you, to do that. I was about to say, I, again, we really appreciate you coming and sharing that you're all eyes of the spectrum of how you've led to your journey and what you do in your work. We're really appreciative. And again, as she's offering all you guys who are debating the body camera evidence, this is a direct source who could tell you guys whether you're running a strong case or a weak case against using that evidence because is it realistic or not? You guys are really debating about the policies and politics that are in real life practice right now. So what you should learn is even the adults don't know what to do right now. That is the biggest takeaway. <laughs> like, they're doing the best they can. <laughs> like, yeah. And do you guys have any last questions before we end today's practice for the day? Um, oh, Yara to... has an ending question. What do you like most about your job? Can you share a time when you persuaded a colleague to accept your point of view? Oh, that happens a lot. One of the nice things about working in my office is we are very collaborative. So we talk about cases between ourselves and among ourselves, and we often don't agree. But sometimes I can be persuaded and other people can be persuaded. That's the advantage of listening and being a critical thinker is you, you, can, you have to have an open mind and be available. Often criminal defense attorneys will persuade me to change my position because they have analyzed things and they show me what they have. Like, okay, I now I agree. That's more information than I had before. So that's very, very helpful. So it sounds like it, like she has a lot of the skill set that you guys already practice in using your own debate. And if you hear new information, just like in your real debates, you're allowed to change your perspective and kind of reevaluate and reshift your arguments. And I would say it sounds like a lot of her job is a lot of listening to make sure you understood and researching. Uh, one more question was, how many years have you worked with juvenile section of law? Okay, so in my most current assignment, I've been here for three years, but I did a three year stint in the mid nineties. And I did a almost a year stint in the late eighties. So, over time, it's about like, juvenile keeps you coming back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she got a love for y'all. She got help in y'all. It's the adult. She's like, okay, yeah, we're done. <laughs> Bye. We're All done right. with oh. this. Like, yeah. I appreciate you making time for us. We appreciate My you coming out today to do practice with us. And that is it for today's practice, you guys. Y'all are free to go. Ms. Maya, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yes, you can if you would like to. Um. So in a case like if a kid smokes or drinks like liquor, um, what do you do in like those type of cases? Uh, because it 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 happens. It happens. I don't know people who do it. Like I'm not related to anybody who does it. But if someone um smokes or or drinks, what um, what are the consequences or, or like, or if have you ever seen a case where someone drinks and smokes and uh, he has gotten caught, and how long has he stayed in jail for? So just smoking or drinking, um, it's not. It's a very bad idea because your brain is still developing until you're 25, and that interferes with appropriate brain development, okay? But that in and of itself is not the problem. The problem with drinking and smoking is that it inhibits your good judgment. And what I see are kids who are smoking and drinking and then decide it's a good idea to drive too fast in a stolen car, which they crash. That's the problem. Um, so they, that can be a much bigger issue is the consequences of drinking and smoking, not the drinking and smoking itself. And somebody just asked, how old am I? I'm 60 years old. Um, so I'm old. <laughs> Let's see, what else? Did that answer your question? Um, kind of. I. Okay. Um, I mainly want to know, like, like, let's say it was like a, like a, like, even like, like if you were to see it, like if you're walking by and you saw like a 12 year old, um, smoking, 
what would you do? Would you re- like do you, you can't arrest you... him? Or she she can't stop her civilian day and go arrest him. That's not her job. Nope. Nope. But I would want to know. Hold him. She'd give him a dirty like, look. A, yeah, I could do that. Like, but like. if, I, if I know his mom, I'm gonna tell his mom. Right. His like. mom's gonna want to know. Yeah. No, she I, cannot sit us in arrest. Why are y'all trying to put this woman in danger? She got as much power as you I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I'm gonna encourage I encourage people to make good choices. I encourage no, people I'm to make wait. good choices. So. The kids think if they become a lawyer, they're gonna be out there doing citizen arrest. Please tell them that's how you go to jail. You can Yeah, be don't do that. That that could be a real abusive situation. You don't need to do that. I don't I don't need to do that. So <laughs> Yeah, let if if somebody needs to get arrested, there are people who can do that, and it's not me. So, <laughs> like, you, know, if you, want to be police, you know, if you want to arrest people, you know, <laughs> you can become a police officer, and then there are certain rules about when you can and cannot arrest somebody. You follow those rules. Thank you for Thanks, your Mr. attention. Andrew, that is it for today. Sorry right. about that. Been Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you all for your attention. Bye, you guys. Have a good day.